right, so lecture 6.4, coordinate frame transformations. Robotics requires we keep track of the positions and orientations of many objects in three space. A rigid body's state can be expressed as a three-dimensional position and orientation or angular position. So that makes for um, six degrees of freedom. We've got three translation and three rotation, so we get six degrees of freedom. You'll also see this as just DOF. And with a coordinate system, that's a minimum of six coordinates, three translation and three rotation. Um, so that's uh, uh, just in general, the requirement for robots in three space. Different objects have different convenient coordinate systems. For instance, a mobile robot might have a body fixed coordinate system with origin at its geometric centroid, x-axis pointing forward, y-axis pointing leftward, and z-axis pointed pointing upward. So that would be a, a right-handed coordinate system, x, y, z. Locating an object in this coordinate system would be different than that of, say, a base station. Consider for a mobile robot a two-dimensional body-fixed coordinate system, O, world coordinate system, W, and pseudo-body-fixed coordinate system, P, that is merely a translation of the world coordinate system to the P origin. See figure 6.5. So we've got a body-fixed, well, so we've got a, a world coordinate system in 2D, um, x, y, sub, w. Um, we have this pseudo body fixed coordinate system, which is just a copy of the world coordinates fixed to the body at the centroid of the body, say um, x, p, y, p. And then a true body fixed in translation and rotation, um, the um, uh, x, o, y, o. Uh, let a point in space in WPO coordinates be represented by the position vector uh, RW or RP or RO. So RW, RP, and RO. RP and RO are on top of each other. See the green is RP, the blue is RO. But um, the uh, coordinate values will be different because in general, um, they are not uh, collinear with each other. Let T be a vector uh, from the W origin to the P origin. So it's this offset, it's the, the displacement of the origins. Translation. Suppose the robot can only translate and not rotate. The W and P coordinate transformations are sufficient to describe its motion. The transformation is that RP plus T is equal to RW, or the world um, vector equals the um, P vector plus the, the translation difference between the two axes. Um, <clears throat> so you can see the standard vector addition, RW equals T plus RP. And you can, of course, solve that for RP um, with subtraction. As we will see in a moment, rotation of a vector is described by a matrix operation on a vector. It is therefore convenient to write translation as a matrix operation in one extra dimension. So what we do is we say that our W is equal to a matrix times RP, where we just want that matrix to translate RP by the T vector. So we added one dimension here to our um, to the, the matrix and to uh, RP, 
So RP now has a one in its last dimension. And that one allows us to simply add these TX and TY components. Um, so you can write the, the uh, vector addition as a multiplication in this way. It's a little bit of a sleight of hand, but it is valid, it does work. Um, the last component then uh, becomes an accounting tool for writing the translation operation in this form, called a homogeneous representation, um, and you'll see this throughout the literature. Um, it's one of the common ways of representing um, translation in three space for robot coordinate systems. Um, see it throughout the literature. The transformation matrix T translates but does not rotate. Okay, so notice that <clears throat> we are moving the X and the Y coordinates by fixed X and Y amounts. Um, and there is no rotation happening to this vector. Okay, there's a little exercise here, 6, 1. Show that RP is equal to T inverse RW by showing it to be equivalent to equation 6, 1, B. So this transformation um, matrix... Move to a new area, then that's my robot. Error three. <laughs> it, it's having trouble with navigating my desk. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I've got uh, this T matrix, and it works to go from RP to RW, um, and presumably it should work uh, with its inverse, but I want you to prove that by showing that um, if you take T inverse and you multiply it by RW, left multiply it, that you'll get RP. From that so that's the exercise <clears throat> all right rigid body transformation so transformation to and from a body fixed coordinate system is usually a rigid body transformation one that changes coordinate frame origin position and orientation but preserves the Euclidean distance between any two points transformations between the W and O coordinate systems above are rigid body transformations. So O is the body fixed. Um, these could be represented as a rotation matrix R transformation followed by a translation by T. So you have to rotate and you have to translate. So um, in this form we rotate the body fixed with R and then we translate to get to RW. Here R uh, rotates counterclockwise by theta with this matrix. So this is one of the rotation matrices, um, counterclockwise rotation by theta. So if you want to uh, rotate something um, or a vector uh, counterclockwise by theta, you can multiply that two vector by this R matrix 6.4. However, we frequently like to write this in a homogeneous representation as well, again adding a component to the vectors such that R becomes 6.5, where we've just added essentially the identity matrix um, for uh, one more dimension to this rotation matrix. Okay, so then the rigid body transformation becomes <clears throat> R0 gets left multiplied by the rotation and then the, the translation. <clears throat> and of course, you can do also the inverse. You can solve this with the inverse as well. All right. Rotation transformations. Rotation transformations such as R above come in a variety of flavors. Euler angles. These rotations are described by the sequential notation about a typically body fixed uh, coordinate system, sequential rotation about a typically body fixed coordinate system. The order matters because rotating about one axis changes the directions of the others. Uh, not one, but several conventions exist for Euler angle rotation. So unfortunately, there's not one agreed upon 
uh, convention for which one comes first, which one comes second, which one comes, one comes third. It's not really an agreed upon convention in terms of um, what the notation is. So it's really all over the place. You have to be a little bit light on your toes when you read um, a, a specific paper or book. Hopefully they are clear about what they're, what they're using for a convention. Um, so then there's fixed angle rotation. Similarly, rotations can be described about, the, about axes, the origin of which remain fixed to the body, but the orientation of which remain fixed to the world frame. So instead of in the traditional Euler angles, um, you can leave the orientation of your axes the same and then um, rotate the, um, uh, the orientation of vectors relative to that. And that is not as common. You'll see it though, so that's called fixed angle. Um, and it's essentially equivalent to Euler angles, but again, uh, it is not um, the sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't follow the conventions that um, you'll see for Euler angles. There are a couple conventions for Euler angles that are more dominant than others. Um, so I'd say fixed angles are less common. Axis angles. Axis angle representations describe a rotation as a unit vector and an angle of rotation about that vector. This actually comes from, uh, interestingly enough, a theorem put forth by Euler about um, a rotation of a body in three dimensions, um, which pretty much states that any rotation of a body can be described by a direction, so a, a unit vector in a specific direction, um, and a rotation about that vector. So um, this this axis angle representation is really nice and in some ways is um, conceptually pretty straightforward. Uh, it doesn't get used a ton um, uh, in part because there are some um, practical reasons why it can be difficult to, to account for that. So um, not as common as Euler angles, which is the most popular of, I would say all of these traditionally, it's Euler angles. Um, and then the last one, quaternions, are another one that are, that are popular. Quaternions are complex numbers with a real part and three, instead of the usual one, imaginary parts. So it's like A, some real number, plus um, I, so imaginary number i times b, where b is a real number, plus another imaginary number, j, times another real number, plus k, another imaginary number, d, where a, b, c, and d are real numbers. So instead of a plus i, b, it's a plus i, b, plus j, c, plus k, d. So we have essentially four components. A real component and then three imaginary components. Um, these are these are a, a sort of complex number that can represent a coordinate, and they can also represent a coordinate uh, a, a vector rotation, um, and they do that by multiplication. So there are these multiplicative forms that you can arrange these quaternions in that will give you rotations of the quaternion coordinate. Um, they can describe rotations in a manner that avoids certain problems. For example, gimbal lock. Uneven ground. Oh, Move to a new area, then press clean. Area three. 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 So annoying. Um, they can describe rotations in a manner that avoids certain problems like gimbal lock and ill-conditioned quanti Ill quantities. So if you um, Look into this too, uh, or, or a little bit more deeply. Euler angles have an issue. Actually, all of these have an issue of um, gimbal lock, it's called, where um, when two of the 
axes of rotation are um, collinear with each other, then there are some rotations that can't be described um, uh, very well, or at least in a, in a well-conditioned manner, um, and they'll cause strange paths to to um, be created. Instead of what you thought was going to happen with a rotation, you'll get get a sort of funny funny path of rotation. So uh, gimbal lock is an issue that quaternions avoid, um, and they also uh, stay away from being ill-conditioned as well because they are numerically more stable. They don't go into really big quantities or really small quantities. Um, so they're very computationally efficient as well, in part for those reasons, um, in part because you don't have to, to um, do as many mathematical operations because a matrix vector uh, product requires a lot more uh, multiplies and additions than um, quaternion multiplication does. So quaternions are pretty great. There's only real, really one, well, a couple of drawbacks of quaternions. First of all, they freak us out usually when we first learn about them. So quaternions um, are not as intuitive to understand. Um, the non-quaternion, and then the other one is the non-quaternion rotation transformations use matrix multiplication, and therefore have homogeneous forms that include translation. But quaternion representations cannot um, uh, include translations, so vector addition must be uh, supplemented um, with a quaternion rotation. So you can rotate in quaternions, but then you have to translate with vector addition. So, um, whereas the other representations, you can do a homogeneous form of your, of your um, transformation, you can't do that with quaternions. So, sort of um, point Euler angles there. Um, so at this point, so this next section is the Ross package TF2. At this point, some things should be clear. One, for a three-dimensional robot with six degrees of freedom, Keeping track of even two coordinate systems, world and body fixed, can be complicated. Two, adding more coordinate systems for arms, sensors, moving objects in the environment, etc., as most real robots require, vastly complicates coordinate transformations. Okay. Three, coordinate transformations change with time as body fixed coordinate systems move. And finally, for keeping track of all this in an ad hoc way would be disastrous, so a systematic approach is required. For these reasons, Ross provides just such a systematic approach via its TF2 package. Um, the TF2 package is uh, a replacement for the older TF package. Um, the TF2 package has some advantages, and I recommend you check out the documentation on that. Pretty interesting. The TF2 package has conventions for coordinate transformation data organized into a tree structure and buffered in time. Time buffering is important. Frequently we need to know not just the latest data but recent data as well. As with all ROS data flow, TF2 communicates via publishing and subscribing to topics. Um, ROS TF2 uses quaternions to apply and store rotation information. However, it is usually easier for us to think in terms of Euler angles. The older TF package provides a nice conversion from Euler angles to quaternions. It hasn't been incorporated into TF2, and I don't think there's a um, plan to do so. So some people just keep TF around to pull up this sort of um, uh, quaternion Euler transformation. Um, there is some work being done, I, I believe, to incorporate this into something that you could pull in outside of TF, but uh, for now, this is the way that a lot of people do it. In the usage example above, um, which pulls from the TF transformations Python library, um, we are pulling in quaternion from Euler as a method 
and um, that's what we use. We give it the rotations, the uh, Euler angle rotations about x, about y, about z, um, and it does it in the, that order, x, y, z. There are other conventions like I mentioned, um, so you could do like y, x, y, or y, z, y, or, or, or several. So uh, you can actually change that in there too, there are options for that. Um, so just so you know, if you're not using x, y, z for your um, three rotations, then that's okay, you can, you can use a different convention, there's an option for that method, so you just look it up. Okay, um, I'll mention that a couple of things, a couple of gotchas here. TF2 is actually uh, something that can be pulled into um, programs outside of ROS. So there's TF2 and there's TF2 ROS. This is the actual package that we'll be um, uh, using. It'll we'll pull in the Python bindings through this. And for more information on the migration from TF to TF2, see this link here. Okay, we're going to try out TF2. There's this fun little um, uh, tutorial that uses TF2. And you can kind of look into it deeper. And there's a tutorial on the, on the ross.org website. Um, but I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a taste of it at this point. So in the terminal window, enter the following to get and compile a turtle TF2 demo. So we'll install using apt-get the, um, the turtle TF2, uh, the TF2 tools, and then TF as well. We'll bring those in, and then we'll launch the demo by doing ROS launch on the, the demo.launch file. Okay, so we'll just do that over in our virtual box. Okay, so I pulled this up so I could just copy and paste this long command in. Ah. Don't think those will be separated, but I'll try it. Yeah. It copied them in oddly. So, just a moment. So, uh, copying and pasting that code in doesn't actually work. You have to type it in. I, if you were to put this into a bash script, it would work. Those line breaks. I'm not sure why the copying and pasting isn't working, but um, it's okay. You can just type them in. Um, I've done the first two and now um, we just need ROS, ROS distro TF and you can type each of them in manually and I had already installed it so it was um, totally fine already so it's already the newest version and yeah that's great so um, now, finally, we should be ready to go to do a uh, ROS launch. I can actually copy and paste this one. So I'll copy this. I'll paste it in. And we have ourselves a turtle sim. But oh, wait, no. No module named NumPy. Oh, that's OK. Um, I ran into this before on the other installation. I have two installations going. Um, this one's the one that's lagging behind that I can show you guys. This one is, is fine if we want to install our um, module NumPy. That's a standard Python library. Let's see what we're working with here. Um, our local version configured, so we're just using the global version, which is our correct 2.717. So if I just do pip install uh, uh, NumPy, then I'll get that installed. Great. So now I think I should be good to launch this demo. Great. So now 
I need to um, move the red turtle around with my um, arrow keyboard buttons. Um, and But I need to have uh, the terminal window selected to control it. So if I There we go, and the green turtle is going to follow me. So the idea here, why this is in the TF2 tutorials, is that the only way that the green turtle and the red turtle can, well, the only way that the green turtle can communicate uh, to figure out where the red turtle is, is via TF2 coordinate transformations. So uh, under the hood, and, if you, and I encourage you to look at this tutorial in greater detail. Under the hood, there is a um, discussion of, well, you can see how TF2 is working here. So drive it around, satisfy yourself that it's awesome and fun and that you're excited to build your own versions of this type of thing. And there's a turtle sim demo. So hope you enjoyed that. Oh yeah, if you hit a wall, it gives you a warning. So, run away. Okay. All right. So, see you guys later.